Oh, a magpie just flew up. Do you know in Australia, it's magpie season. And I don't know if you've ever been attacked by a magpie, but it is truly scarring. It is a one out of the box experience. Yes, of course, here I am with my beautiful French press. I, I was thinking about what to create next. And I was thinking what you would think about my last couple of pieces of content. And I thought, gee, gee whiz, I, I need to sit down and have a chat with you. Excuse me. Oh, it's not quite straight. It's a bit crooked. Isn't the sound just such a comforting sound? I have, I have lots of news. It's, uh, it's been just beautiful today because it's been raining and the animals have been out, which is wonderful. I'm going through a period of time without alcohol at the moment. So I think it's my sixth day without a glass of wine at night. And that's, that's uh, an achievement. I'm proud of that. And I've gone back to gym, uh, training very hard, which... I've spilt that everywhere. Oh, I've spilt it everywhere. Aren't I a little grub? I've gone back to gym with a personal trainer, which I absolutely love going to gym. That's a, a really big part of who I perceive myself as, somebody who trains. How do you see yourself? Is there a particular way you see yourself? Do you see yourself as an a, B, or C. Do you see yourself as someone who crochets, who reads books, who does sport? For me, animals, health, and lifting weights, fitness, has always been core to my spirit. Some of you are listening via audio. Some of you are listening via video. Welcome to my podcasters and welcome to my video family. Please consider sharing this content. Please consider commenting or if you're on my podcast, posting a review. I've just loaded an extended body scan and I would love, love to hear what you think of it. If you want, if you're on my podcast, you can email me at laurenostoskyfenton at gmail.com, spelled L-A-U-R-E-N-O-S-T-R-O-W-S-K-I-F-E-N-T-O-N at gmail.com. Excuse me. I would love some feedback on the longer pieces of content because my gut feeling is that you, you like the longer pieces of content. I'm just gonna get my feet under this desk so I can really look into your eyes. That's funny, isn't it? Because this is, a, this is my iPhone, but I can imagine that I'm looking into your eyes. I was looking at some uh, Gabor Mate content, which I love, and he was talking about the myth of, of being normal. And I thought about the words recovery and the words healed. I was a specialist mental health worker in Victoria and we would subscribe. We were supposed to adhere to the uh, recovery oriented uh, program or practice in helping to support people with mental health needs. And the recovery-oriented practice is a practice that does not look at the word recovery as a complete process. The um, recovery-oriented practice is an ongoing process so that when somebody has mental health needs, we do not see it as tick, 
Okay, you're done, off you go, bye. Like out of the waiting room at the doctor's, bye. You're all well now. The word recovery is seen as an ongoing process, not a competency-based achievement where you go tick or cross. And I really like that, don't you? This notion that something is ever evolving, that you don't have to be competent or incompetent, that you're just moving through the process. And I thought about that. I thought about grief as well, that grief is a process that starts with some brain fog, shock, fear, and then evolves through a number of different processes depending on the unique sense of person in that situation. We all process grief differently. The word to heal. We talk a lot in pop culture at the moment about healing and doing the work. I'm not wildly excited with the use of the word healed, implying that somehow we open this miraculous door, turn the handle, and we step through and we shut it. I'm healed. I'm better. Bye. Everything that bothered me is behind that door and the door is shut. Because it's not really like that, is it? When we are traumatized or we're hurt or we experience grief, what do we do? We experience, it's a process of recovery. It's a process. How do you feel when someone says to you, I'll just move on, I'll get over it. It's done. Or what's that other phrase that I, don't love. I'll build a bridge and get over it was something that was said when I worked in jails. That was one of the topical, uh, the rhetoric that was used. Build a bridge and get over it. Really? Is that what we do when we experience grief? We have the grief on this side of the bridge. We build a bridge and we get over it. Bye, grief. Bye. I don't think so. How do you process grief? How do you process life? Do we ever heal or do we grow, develop, change? We are only the sum of the way we internalize past moments. That's our experience of the present. And I found this awesome word. Maybe you've heard this word before. I don't know. But I just thought, this is such an awesome word. I thought for a moment I created it and I felt really smart. And then I looked it up and thought, ah, you didn't create it. In 1952, I think in England, 1952 or 1852, you can look it up. The word was coined re-become. And it means to re-become, to become again. I love the notion of becoming because it's a process, it's an evolving. And I love the thought of a caterpillar turning into a, a butterfly or just the natural evolvement of aging, that we become something more beautiful as we grow older. We have the opportunity to, to develop more wisdom. We re-become. So I was thinking about grief. And instead of saying we get over a loss, what we actually do is re-become. In life, we go through a process of becoming and becoming and becoming. And we can define that process. It's a practice. It's not easy. It can be pretty yucky and difficult. But we can re-become. And that re-becoming is how we choose to learn 
how to internalize the past. We can change. Not easy. Life is about becoming. And re-becoming is what we do when we move through grief. We don't move on. We move through, step by step. We don't build a bridge and get over it. We take one step at a time and we grow fitter. We develop wisdom. Our lens through which we see the world changes. Excuse me. Have you had, have you had any stages or experiences through which you re-became a re-becoming? Or perhaps you could start re-becoming. There was a story I heard today, and I can't remember the speaker. I wish I could. It was on, um, ah, I've forgotten. This woman told this story, this narrative about another woman who lost her husband and she was so upset. So she would visit the grave regularly and she would take a deck, deck chair with her when she would visit the grave so that she could hang out with her ex-husband's spirit or place or vibe or feel she's spending time with him. So she would always keep a deck chair in her car and her friends felt they would be helping if one day they removed the deck chair and took it away. Were they really helping or were they refusing to allow her her process of grief? She continued to go and visit her ex-husband, but in future, she didn't share it. She didn't feel comfortable sharing that she wanted to sit by his grave and hang out. I think it's so important that we allow people to grieve as they need to grieve. It's a unique and captivating process. I think we need to allow others to re-become in a way that suits them. Have you got, have you, do you have any stories of re-becoming? I think that I've had several stages of re-becoming. I think when my beautiful, awesome, funny, clever, smart, wise brother took his life, I re Became, I had a re-becoming because I felt so close to him. I couldn't envisage living without him. And then I needed to do all the same things we did together without him. He was a really wild guy. We would go to raves and I would always say, Damien, it's too late and it's too long and we've been here three days and I don't know those people and he just do these wild things. There was an occasion, I wasn't at this occasion, but there was an occasion where he was walking along a road and he saw a horse, so he jumped the fence and jumped on this horse and rode everywhere. And I was with him once uh, at a well-known place at Melbourne and there was travelling theatre, you know, when they make up theatre acrobatics as they walk along, improv. And Damien just joined in. But he didn't just join in with these acrobats. He did a really good job. He started balancing and he was amazing. He was so gifted. And there was so much we did together that I enjoyed, but I took for granted. So when he, and we had similarities, we had a real kinship. When he left, I needed to move through the process of re-becoming because I was Damien's sister and he was my bro. And I had another stage of re-becoming when my ex-husband left me. I saw myself as this label, as a mum and as a married person. And then that label was no longer 
so I had a re-becoming. Have you had any re-becomings and how have you moved through them? Perhaps you can comfort each other in the comments as you do so well. If you're listening to the podcast, you don't have that <coughs> avenue, I'm sorry. It's interesting, isn't it? And the word recovery, we don't ever reach the recovered point, but we are constantly recovering. Recovery is a experience rather than an ending. And in life as humans, we love to shut doors. We love to open a door, do the work, shut the door, I am healed. Does that really exist? What do you think? Thanks for listening to my content. I really appreciate it. Have an awesome day of re-becoming.